Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Transcendental Fiction. We're looking at Joseph Conrad's novel Heart of Darkness. We have um, already started with the text. We'll look at a certain section today, especially the section where Mahler goes and uh, he gets interviewed by this mysterious Belgian company, uh, which is to um, hire him to go to Congo for the ivory trade. Uh, now the reason why I've selected the scene is we talk about the neurosis in the whole process. Uh, it's, it becomes a very automaton-like process where a company hires someone uh, and then there's almost no human quality about this entire experience which is something which makes it interesting for us looking at the uh, entire machinery of imperialism. Now what that also is reflective of is the inhuman quality or the non-human quality of imperialism. It becomes almost uh, an automatic process of exploitation, an automatic process of operation uh, which is obviously evident in the way in which the hiring takes place uh, in this particular uh, section. So, um, among other things, this is also an important scene because it touches upon some of the contemporary concerns in Europe. Uh, criminology, for instance, was a big thing. Uh, uh, you know, the whole idea of degeneration was a big thing. Uh, so, all the pseudo-medical uh, philosophies, the pseudo-medical thesis around criminology, uh, degeneration, uh, those are becoming more and more systematized in 19th century, uh, late 19th century, uh, which is the era in which uh, this novel is set. Uh, and Omalu finds himself in a situation where um, the whole idea of going to Africa uh, also poses a threat of degeneration, also poses a threat towards uh, a certain kind of criminality because obviously as we all know today, uh, the whole idea of degeneration and criminality was always uh, conferred on the other, the non-European, uh, especially the African uh, and who was considered to be savage, uh, you know, violent, uh, animalistic, etc. So, any proximity to the African wilderness, any proximity to the African um, you know, native or the savage uh, would always pose a threat uh, for degeneration and criminality for the European. And this section where Marlow gets uh, hired and there is a sort of a medical test done to him as well in terms of determining his fitness to go and work for the Belgian company. So, all that becomes part of a very complex cultural process where uh, the European, the non-European other was exploited, but at the same time he was feared. Uh, the non-European space was exploited, but at the same time feared uh, for the possibility of de degeneration and uh, criminality. So, criminology, which was um, the sort of a pseudo-scientific discourse around that time, where uh, uh, criminality was equated with the skull size, with the size of the forehead, uh, with teeth, with uh, skin color, of course, etc. Uh, so, we find how those characteristics were very heavily racialized. Uh, they are almost always uh, non-white uh, and also, you know, there is a degree of anti-Semitic quality about uh, criminals as well. So, you know, uh, for instance, uh, if you read Bram Stoker's Dracula, you find that, you know, uh, the whole idea of uh, equating criminality with the Jew was very rampant and especially in the way uh, Dracula gets represented, the physiognomy of Dracula for instance is very, very stereotypically uh, Jewish kind of uh, physiognomy. I mean that was how the stereotypical projection on the Jew happened, right? So, this is, uh, this thing is interesting in all these aspects. Now, the reason why this is important for us because what we see uh, through all these discourses, pseudo discourses, um, this whole idea of the threat the whole fear and panic of degeneration, etc., is that how darkness, which is to say ignorance or non-enlightenment and non-illumination, uh, superstition for the matter, is very much part of the European phenomenon over here. It's not really located in Africa, but it's all idea about the confusion about criminality, uh, the racism around criminality, uh, the very regressive idea of the degenerate, etc. Now, all that exhibits darkness, you know, darkness in terms of lack of knowledge, uh, in terms of confused knowledge or confusion in knowledge, which is interestingly located right in the heart of Europe, right in Brussels, which is the site of the imperial machinery uh, where the imperial office is positioned, where, you know, it, it sends all the emissaries, all the agents of the empire, you know, down the Congo, down Ganges, down different parts of the world. But this is where the money comes back, this is where the capital grows, this is where the imperial capital happens uh, and is operative. So, to see darkness located there 
uh, to see uh, pseudo knowledge located there, uh, to see automatism located there is obviously um, you know, did by the fact it's reflective of the fact that darkness is not really uh, an anti or uh, non white phenomenon. Darkness is very much part of the white civilization as well, white western civilization as well, which connects us back to the very beginning of the novel. If you remember, uh, Malu had started the novel by saying that this too, which was in Thames, the river Thames, the glorious river of civilization, he said, Well, this too had once upon a time been. A heart of darkness, which is to say that you know the whole idea of darkness and light, civilization and non-civilization. These are very mutable categories, and these change all the time, right? And that's something which we come back to as we read this particular section. So I just dive into the text, and we'll see how uh, the very neurotic quality, the very automatic quality, the the anxiety in the whole process is uh, described and foregrounded and, and dramatized in some details. And I quote: "This should be on your screen." A narrow and deserted street in the deep shadow, high houses, innumerable windows with Venetian blinds, uh, a dead silence, grass sprouting right and left, immense double doors standing ponderously ajar. I slipped through one of those cracks and went up a swept and ungarnished staircase as uh, arid as a desert and opened the first door I came to. So it, it just seems like a very, very uh, non human. Uh, non metropolis, uh, non metropolitan kind of a setting. It just seems like a desert, and you know? it just seems like you know something of a mirage. Uh, he just gets lost in a maze. So something very primal about this particular setting. And also, if you take a look at the language where he's saying, "I slipped through one of the cracks," it's almost like a fall, uh, falling into an abyss. Uh, so moving up or navigating through the staircases, uh, this Venetian blinds, very complex windows and doors, it's like falling into an abyss. Fallen down a, a crag and into an abyss, and that's something which Marlow is experiencing away and relaying it to his listeners. Uh, and opened the first door I came to. Two women, one fat and the other slim, sat on straw bottomed chairs, knitting black wool. So, again, this whole idea of two women uh, sitting silently and knitting black wool is a very classical image of fate. Uh, fate being a woman who knits wool, uh, wool being the obviously the passages of time, which is sort of you know knitting and unknitting wool at the same time. So you're knitting and unknitting time at the same time. So fate becomes an entanglement of time and destiny. So it's a very classical Greek image of women uh, you know, knitting wool uh, becoming uh, agents of uh, destiny, agents of time, agents of fate. Right? And that the classical kind of an imaginary is used and reused over here. Uh, in a modern setting, uh, which is obviously uh, modern Brussels, the, the capital of Belgium, where Malou is, uh, finds himself uh, about to be interviewed. Okay, they were sitting and knitting black wool. Uh, the slim one got up and walked straight at me, still knitting with downcast eyes. And only just as I began to think of getting out of her way, as you would for a somnambulist, uh, stood still and looked up. So, again, look at the wordlessness of the whole uh, process. The, uh, emotional lessons of the whole process. She just walks up to Marlow, still knitting the wool, uh, and only when Marlow is beginning to think that maybe she's sleepwalking, she's a somnambulist and is about to move away from our direction, she looks up at that moment. Her dress was as plain as an umbrella cover, and she turned round without a word and preceded me uh, into a waiting room. So, again, the word lessness is important, which is part of the neurosis over here. It, it has an automaton like quality. It, it's like a machine. It's, it's actually in the heart of the imperial machine at the moment. Uh, and there's no need for any word, there's no need for any human intimacy, there's no need for any human touch, there's no human quality about it at all. So, it's like we're walking to a, a bunch of automata. Uh, as it was. So, all these people are figures of automata, they are automatic figures who are just propelling the entire machinery forward and Malu finds himself in the company of these automata. Okay, so she preceded me into a waiting room, I gave my name and looked about. Deal table in the middle, plain chairs all around the walls. Uh, on one end a large shining map marked with all the colours of a rainbow. There was a vast amount of red, good to see at any time because one knows that some real work is done in there. A deuce of a lot of blue, a little green, smears of orange, and on the east coast a purple patch to show that were the jolly pioneers of progress drink the jolly leg of beer. Right, so again, look at the divisions over here. Each color corresponds to something. There's a color of exploitation, there's a color of merriment, 
and quite clearly each color denotes uh, a country's location or the spaces or the territory's location in the entire colonial process. So there's a patch which draws the, from the colonial machinery, there's another patch which um, you know, supplies merriment, uh, there's another patch which gets abused, etc. So all the patches correspond to certain uh, you know, geopolitical positions at that point of time, uh, certain cultural positions and certain economic positions at that point of time. So this mapping is quite literally a mapping of privilege that Malu is witnessing. So it's looking at a map, a real map, a patch with different colors, and each color corresponds to a position and privilege, whether it's privileged or underprivileged, whether it's exploiting or the exploited uh, territory, and that, that's determining uh, its location in that map. However, I wasn't going into any of these. I was going into the yellow, dead in the center, and the river was there, fascinating, deadly like a snake. Again, the primal quality is important over here. <clears throat> In the river Congo, of course, it's getting, it's getting mentioned over here. And Malu looks at it for the first time and thinks of it as some kind of a serpentine presence. It's almost like a biblical snake, uh, which is about to seduce him and to uh, into this heart of darkness. Right? Fascinating, deadly like a snake. Oh, a door opened. Um, your white haired secretarial head, but wearing a compassionate expression, appeared, and a skinny forefinger beckoned me into the sanctuary. So, again, the wordlessness is important over here. A white head appears. And he's beckoned by your finger, you know, into a sanctuary, the meeting room, presumably. The light was dim, and a heavy writing desk squatted in the middle. From behind the structure came out an impression of a pale plumpness in a frock coat. So again, there's a female presence uh, in this room, and she's a secretary taking down notes, maybe. The great man himself. <clears throat> so the great man, the owner, presumably, the, the uh, executive officer in this company, this colonial company, <coughs> he was five feet six. I should judge, and had his grip on the, hand, uh, on the handle end uh, of ever so many millions. He shook hands, I fancy, murmured vaguely, was satisfied with my French, bon voyage. So again, uh, this great man uh, meets them, and again, there's no human quality at all, there's no emotive communication at all. It's a very matter of fact, uh, business-like communication, and it's almost as if he's been scanned uh, for fitness. Um, so the only thing is fit for this voyage because his French was satisfactory and he wishes Marlow good luck. In about 45 seconds, the family serve again in the waiting room with a compassionate secretary who, full of desolation and sympathy, made me sign some document. I believe I undertook, amongst other things, not to disclose any trade secrets. Well, I'm not going to. So again, uh, this is coming back into present time. So Marlow is saying, well, I had to sign some disclosure forms, non-disclosure forms where I had to sort of make an oath, make a promise uh, in writing that I wouldn't disclose any trade secrets of the company. Well, and it says, I'm not going to tell you any secret now either. Right, so again, the whole cutting back and across time is important. The two different kinds of narratives that play away. Right. I began to feel slightly uneasy. So this neurosis is beginning to make its presence felt. The anxiety is making its presence felt. You know, I'm not used to such ceremonies. And there was something ominous in the atmosphere. It was just as though I had been led into some conspiracy, I don't know, something not quite right, and I was glad to get out. So again, this is the beginning of the ambivalence that Malu experiences throughout his imperial experience. Uh, he's about to feel that something is not quite right, something is not quite uh, you know, correct in the whole process. And, uh, you know, he's saying that it's almost as if he's been led into some conspiracy. Uh, something quite nefarious, something evil is about to take place, but he doesn't quite know what. He can't put a finger on it and define it as such. And this ambivalence, this cynicism, this uncertainty is something which informs Malu uh, throughout the entire narrative. And he becomes almost uh, a very nervous, neurotic narrator. So he carries a neurosis with him wherever he goes. Uh, that gets obviously compounded and accentuated in the Congo. But when he, even when he comes back to London, and even when he's telling the story now, he's still being a very, very neurotic narrator. Right? He doesn't quite know what happened. He's cognitively very confused. And his narration is very, very neurotic and unreliable in the same, in the same degree. So he begins to feel uneasy. There's almost like a, a, you know, a physical problem for him, and he wants to get out. In the outer room, the two women knitted black wool feverishly. Again, uh, the word feverish is important because what it does, it just creates a claustrophobia around the entire atmosphere. It becomes a very neurotic, uh, claustrophobic condition. Uh, whereby you know the whole idea of this, this becomes unhealthy, unhygienic, and the woman looked very feverish, the almost frenzied presences, uh, and the knitting wool uh, feverishly and very, very furiously. People were arriving, and the younger one was walking back and forth, introducing them. The old one sat on a chair. 
of flat cloth slippers were propped up on a foot warmer and a rat and, and a cat re reposed on her lap. So again, the, the presence of this feline uh, animal, the cat on her lap while she is knitting wool. Again, this sort of suggests some kind of a classical image of fate, uh, of whimsy, uh, of fancy, etc. And obviously, this whole idea of time and fate become important over here. She wore a starched white affair in her head, had a wart on her cheek and silver rimmed spectacles hung on the tip of her nose. She glanced at me above her glasses. The swift and indifferent placidity of that look troubled me. So, there is almost like a clinical uh, scan like quality about the gaze, very swift and very indifferent. There is no human connect and that is something I keep telling uh, throughout this particular session that the non-human quality about this entire process of recruitment is obviously connected to the inhuman quality of the exploitation, the colonial exploitation. So, the non-human and inhuman uh, connected categories over here. Yeah. They are connected categories in the sense that you know the politics of exploitation depends on the non-human clinical quality over here which Marlow is experiencing for the first time. Uh, two youths with foolish and cheery countenances were being piloted over and she threw at them the same quick glance of unconcerned wisdom. Again, the indifference is obviously very palpable, unconcerned wisdom. She seemed to know all about them and about me too. This is an all-pervading gaze, something which is seen through Marlow's uh, appearance. It is like a penetrating quality about him. An eerie feeling came over me. She seemed uncanny and fateful. Often far away there, I thought of these two guarding the door of darkness, knitting black wool as from a warm pall, one introducing, uh, introducing continuously to the unknown and the other scrutinizing the cheery and foolish faces with unconcerned uh, old eyes. Avi, old knitter of the black wool, Mortier de Salutant. Not many, many of those who she looked at ever saw her again, not half by a long way. So, Morituri uh, Te Salutin is like welcome of the death, right? A welcome to the land of the dead. So, again, there is a classical quality about it, it is almost like going into the nether world. And interestingly, we find that how the nether world in Heart of Darkness is not necessarily always about uh, going to a non European space because this happens to be right at the heart of the European metropolis. This is Brussels, this is where the colonial machinery is located uh, in a very privileged position. But even going in this particular office is like walking into a heart of darkness. It is like walking into the, the dead land, the netherland, uh, in the land of hates uh, in classical mythology where you have to be shipped into it and once you get into it everything around you is very dense and claustrophobic and uncanny. And the word uncanny keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, and the, the word darkness comes there to people agents who are guarding the door of darkness. So, the moment you enter the door, you cross the threshold and you enter the heart of darkness. So, again, uh, and this again goes back to the beginning of the novel where Malu is saying that even London was once upon a time the heart of darkness. So, the whole idea of darkness gets sort of more uh, problematic over here because it is not necessarily about Africa, about Congo, about what happens in there. It is also about what is close to home, it is what's close to what you can commonly consumed as enlightenment, logic, knowledge, uh, and reason, rationality, etc. So, all these categories, um, the, the sites of civilization as it were, they too are almost embedded with darkness over here. And the classical category is important, the classical mythological way is important because this is quite literally a moving into hates, netherworld, right? And Malu has experience of moving into an uncanny space where everyone can see through everyone and no words are spoken, there is no human compassion, there is no human connect, uh, everything is like very wordless and, and automatic in quality. And that obviously becomes the machinery of colonialism with which the entire idea of imperialism is operative. And now we come to this very uh, sort of social Darwinist uh, medical knowledge or medical politics over here, which is important for, uh, for us to uh, revisit because you know what's interesting is how the whole idea of racism, the whole idea of imperialism, was sort of sanctioned to a large extent by medical science, the contemporary medical science, which uh, proved quote unquote empirically that the European brain was superior to the non-European brain because the European skull size was different than the non-European skull size. So, all the physiognomy markers of skull size, the shape of the forehead, the shape of the teeth etc. So, all this became uh, markers of some innate uh, cerebral qualities, innate faculty, innate uh, in the mental situations like violence, civilization, you know, domesticity, um, rationality, etc. So, all these were equated or marked through some material markers, some physiognomy markers over here. And the doctor over here is obviously here to determine Marlow's fitness for the whole program. 
uh, and by fitness he's going to measure his skull size, he's going to you know, ask about uh, any degeneration in the family, any madness and insanity in the family, etc. So again, the panic of degeneration, the panic of criminality uh, is very much palpable over here and the doctor is obviously asking the social Darwinist questions about uh, genetics, I mean there's no genetics, but hereditary diseases, uh, insanity, etc. And because, you know, there's also this idea that this is a person, Malu, who's about to go to the Congo, uh, to Africa. Uh, so he's going to go very, very close to what degeneration is commonly consumed as, as the non-white space, the other space, etc. So it makes sense, quote unquote, for the company to determine its medical fitness for the whole program. Again, very, very social downness in quality. There was yet a visit to the doctor, a simple formality, assured uh, me the secretary, with an air of taking an immense part in all my sorrows. Accordingly, a young chap wearing his hat over the left eyebrow, some clerk I suppose there, must have been clerks in the business, though the house was still as a house in the city of the dead, came from somewhere upstairs and led me forth. He was shabby and careless, with ink stains on the sleeves of his jacket, and his cravat was large and billowy, uh, under a chin shaped like the toe of an old boot. It was a little too early for the doctor, so I proposed a drink, and thereupon he developed a vein of joviality. So they're about to get you know, a little drink before the doctor arrives, and this guy, this very uh, shabby looking guy, you know, maybe some kind of a uh, doctor's underling or a doctor's assistant, he begins to open up to Malu. As we sat over our worm outs, he glorified the company's business, and by and by, I expressed casually my surprise at him not getting out there. So, you know, he talks about the company's business in very, very positive terms. So, so Malu asks him the obvious question, to how come you are not there? Why are you not there in the you know, heart of the empire, where the empire really is? He became very cool and collected all at once. I'm not such a fool as I look, quote Plato to his disciples. He said sententiously, emptied his glass with a resolution and we rose. Right, so again, uh, look at the abruptness of this particular sentence. So when he gets more and more candid with Malu, he talks about how positive the company's policies were, and then Malu at some time, at some point, innocuously asks him, well, if he's so convinced about the company, how come you're not there in the Congo? How come you're not there in Africa when you're making profit for the company? At which point, his tone changes completely and very dramatically, and he says, I'm not as fool as I look to be. Right, and he finishes his drinks, and he arose, he, he, he gets up. So again, there's something very, uh, clinical and sinister about this entire episode and this is something which pervades the whole scene. The sinister, grey, uh, mysterious quality about this whole enterprise of colonialism and there's a translucent quality about it as well. Malo sort, sort of can't see through it entirely but he sees himself being seen through completely. So he's like surrounded by machines, he's surrounded by all this gaze uh, that very metonymically uh, looks at him in terms of his fitness, in terms of his uh, and a mental health in terms of his uh, ability to control the empire, etc. But he himself has very little idea, a very vague idea of his surroundings, right? And again, this is something which will continue in the Congo. Even when he's sailing down the Congo, he'll have very little idea uh, what's going on around him. And that's something which we'll look at in some details when we come to that point. But even here, while supposedly the heart of civilization, the heart of knowledge, illumination, etc., he finds it very difficult to grasp his reality, to find meaning, to navigate the meaning with what's around him. And that's something which uh, he keeps coming up against throughout the story. And now he goes to the doctor. The old doctor felt my pulse, evidently thinking of something else a while. Good, good for that, he mumbled, and then with a certain eagerness asked me whether I would let him measure my head. Again, this is a very, was a very common practice among uh, criminologists at that point of time. This whole idea of equating madness with the skull size uh, with, or with the violence with skull size, etc. Because all these empirical markers, these metonymy markers were very you know, rampantly consumed as some sort of accurate knowledge and you know, there was a theory of racism, a theory of European superiority which was published and, and consumed palpably, which empirically proved and argued that you know, the European was less prone to violence, less prone to insanity, less prone to murder than in non-Europeans. So again, this whole idea, this whole combination of statistics and biology or this biopolitics of medical knowledge is something that we see at very close uh, quarters, from very close quarters away, yeah, which obviously accentuates or corroborates what is historically true, the collusion between uh, biomedicine and imperialism. The collusion between medicine and imperialism, which produced the whole idea of biocapital or biomedicine, where medicine becomes racialized, uh, medicine becomes motivated by ideology, medicine becomes politically and racially informed, uh, and in that sense it produces theories and theses which will accentuate 
a certain kind of racist uh, ideology, a certain kind of a political foreign policy ideology at work. She is about to measure Malo's head. Rather surprised, I said, uh, I said yes, when he, when he produced a, long, a thing like the calipers and got the dimensions back and front of the, uh, the, in every way. Taking notes carefully, he was an unshaven little man in the treadbare coat like a jabardine with his feet and slippers, and I thought him a harmless fool. I always ask leave in the interest of science to measure the crania of those going out there, he said. And when they come back to you, I ask, oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. So again, this ominous quality of a one-way traffic, right? You just go to Congo and never come back. It takes away your life, it takes away your existential being, it takes away your sanity, your rationality, etc. So he says, the doctor says, I've never seen anyone who's come back from the Congo. So I always measure the crania of the people who are about to leave for the sake of science, because he's, again, making an equation between a certain kind of physiognomy and a certain kind of propensity, right? The propensity for adventure, danger, which can very quickly connect to the propensity towards degeneration, as we'll see. Uh, okay, he smiled as if at some quiet joke. So you're going out there, famous, interesting too. He gave me a searching glance and made another note. Ever any madness in a family? So again, this becomes a series of hereditary questions about Marlowe's uh, chain in a family, if there's any madness or not. Uh, he asks in a, in a matter of fact tone, I felt very annoyed. Is, is that a question in the interest of science too? It would be, he said, without taking notice of my irritation. Interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot. Uh, so again, uh, this whole idea of changing in the brain becomes interesting. Are you an alienist? I interrupted. Every doctor should be a little. So again, alienist this belongs to a particular science of knowledge, uh, which is again a very complex mixture of some pseudo-spiritual thing at the same time, some pseudo-medical thing, which is rampant at that time, along with criminology, along with degeneration, panic, and late 19th century. Uh, I have a little theory which you masseurs who go out there must help me to prove. This is my share of the advantages of my, that my country shall reap from the possession of such a magnificent dependency. The mere wealth I leave to others. Pardon my questions, but you are the first Englishman coming under my observation. I hastened to assure him that I was not the least typical. If I were you, said I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be talking like this with you. What you say is rather profound and probably erroneous, he said with a laugh. Avoid irritation, more than exposure to the sun. Adieu. How do you English say? Oh, goodbye, goodbye, adieu. In the tropics, one must be very, one must be before everything, keep calm. He lifted a warning finger. Do calm, do calm, adieu. So again, uh, all these voices, all these voicelessness, this wordlessness, all these come together to create this one machinery of imperialism in which Marlowe finds himself. It's almost like a heart of a machine, uh, the belly of a machine, which is about to churn him out. and classify him as an agent of the empire. And right before he's, uh, he's coming out of this, he's, he's a doctor who's taking all kinds of pseudo-scientific interests in him in terms of his propensity towards degeneration, propensity towards madness, etc. But he's already almost mad because he's going to Africa. And that's the common assumption over here. Right, so again, look at the collusion between medicine and colonialism, between medicine and economy over here, which is obviously creating this bio-capital. So this doctor becomes a very symbolic presence over here. Uh, he's voicing contemporary concerns with insanity, panic, degeneration, etc., which was obviously quite heavily racialized in quality. One more thing remained to do, to say goodbye to my excellent aunt. Uh, I found a triumphant, so again, the aunt is a person who made this contact for Malu and, you know, uh, you know, and he goes and sees on, but she's the only presence in this uh, entire uh, uh, novel who has some kind of a female assertion, uh, some kind of female voice. Right? Everyone else in this uh, entire novel, all of the females in this novel, are already spoken to, either spoken to, or spoken about. As in the case of Marlowe's intended and his, um, you know. African mistress. But the aunt in Malu, he seems to have aunt in Malu, he seems to have some kind of an assertive agency over here. I had a cup of tea, the last decent cup of tea for many days, uh, very, again, very, very English, and in a room that most soothingly looked just as you would expect a lady's drawing room to look. We had a long, quiet chat by the fireside. In the course of these confidences, it became quite plain to me that I had been represented to the wife of the high dignitary, and goodness knows uh, of how many more people besides, as an exceptional and gifted creature, a piece of good fortune for the company, a man you don't get hold of every day. So again, this whole idea of him becoming an asset to the company, uh, he, he learns that this is something, this is the way he's been projected to the company. And also, look at the way in which uh, this is how uh, 
the human commodification takes place. He's an asset to the company. He's an instrument, a tool to the company, which will reap them lots of benefits, reap them lots of profit, which, which manufacture privileges for them. That's how he's been presented to the company right, as a commodity, as a very useful commodity. Good heavens. And I was going to change, I was going to take charge of the two penny, half penny uh, river steamboat with a penny whistle attached. So he's going to be in charge of this very shabby little steamboat with a very shabby crew and a little whistle. It appeared, however, I was also one of the workers with a capital, you know, uh, something like an emissary of light. Again, the worker with a capital W is important because he's an agent of the empire. And the agent, obviously, is a very loaded word. And look at the way in which. Uh, the agent is dressed up and described. He's an emissary of knowledge, illumination, civilization, etc. That's how imperialism cloaked itself. Right. And even Kurtz is seen as someone later in the novel as the finest agent of the empire, the finest agent of Europe. He embodies the highest point of civilization, the highest point of illumination, the highest point of knowledge, etc. So that is how the entire machinery of imperialism is dressed up. So the agents are sent as emissaries uh, to the dark places of civilization to, to cure them, to civilize them, to uplift them, etc. Right? Um, something like an emissary of light, something like a lower soul of apostle. Again, very biblical quality about the entire description is important for us. There had been such a lot of uh, rot let loose in print and talk just about that time. And the excellent woman living right in the rush of the, all that humbug got carried off her feet. And this is where the cynicism of uh, Marlowe comes in. And he realizes that this, all this is rubbish. Uh, the whole idea of the imperial agent as being the emissary of light, the emissary of education, the emissary of civilization was just circulated in print media and consumed uncritically by all the people. And my aunt, uh, Malu says, my aunt is someone who's very unquestionably consumed it and she's a believer in that uh, narrative of imperialism being a civilized emission as an emissary of light, etc. So she got carried off her feet. She talked about those, about weaning those ignorant millions from their horrid ways. Till upon my word, she may be quite uncomfortable. I ventured to hint that a company was run for profit. So again, this is a very clear uh, uh, incongruity in terms of narratives, in terms of perspectives over here. And again, this is quite gendered as well. And this is something we'll come back at the end of the novel as well. Marlowe's aunt seems to be a consumer of the knowledge of the belief that imperialism was a noble thing, it's, it's a very Christian thing, it's a very biblical thing. The white agents are going out there to rescue the horrid people from the horrid ways, etc. And all this talk about uh, imperialism being a civilized mission, imperialism being a uh, emissary uh, like quality, imperialism being a you know, educational mission and educational enterprise makes Marlowe uh, uncomfortable because he's already seen the heart of darkness to a little extent, to a you know, significant extent when he goes through the Brussels office, that's where you're seen where the entire machinery of imperialism works. And he knows for a fact that, you know, this is a company just out there to make profit. And he's trying to hint that to his aunt that, well, all that talk about, all that humbug, all that rubbish, that rigmarole about imperialism being a civilizing mission, about an educational mission, about an enlightening mission, uh, is quite opposite to the fact that it's also a profit making mission. Uh, the company runs in profit, which is to say that it's quite mercenary in quality. It's more, it's more mercenary and less missionary in quality. And it is probably got more to do with profit making for the white company, uh, for the white European company, than for the upliftment of the uh, poor African souls, which is the narrative that is consumed uh, by the aunt of up. And the same kind of consumption operates at the end of Heart of Darkness, when, for instance, when we'll do that more in more details when we come to that section. But suffice it to say, when Marlowe comes back from the colonies, when he's about to give the report about Kurtz, who is intended, uh, the person who is supposed to marry, he, he can't tell her that she, he had a mistress in Africa. He can't tell her that imperialism was about the horror. He can't tell her that the dying words of Kurtz were the horror of the horror. So when he's asked by Kurtz's intended, what were his dying words? All he can say that you, your name were his dying words. So he has to lie. He has to misinform the insider in imperialism. So all this woman over here, uh, Malu's uh, aunt and Kurtz's intended, they are classically situated as the misinformed, the naive consumers of uh, imperialism. So they are the, obviously they are getting the benefits of imperialism, but at the same time, they're naively consuming imperialism as a 
a different kind of narrative, uh, as an, a civilizational narrative, as an educational narrative, etc. And Marlowe's cynicism is palpable at the very beginning, even before he goes to the hollow darkness, even before he goes to Conger, he already knows this is a hollow darkness. Uh, he already knows that you know, any glorious uh, uh, understanding of imperialism is probably a wrong thing. It's not a glorious enterprise at all. It's a very inglorious enterprise. And an inglorious quality of imperialism is something which Heart of Darkness constantly foregrounds and describes. So he ventured to hint that a company was run for profit. So it's not really about a normal mission at all. It's a profit making machinery and it's trying to tell the aunt that. You forget, dear Charlie, that a laborer is worthy of his hire. Uh, she said brightly, it's queer how out of touch with truth women are. So again, look at the gendered quality of truth over here. It's almost sexist in quality that women are out of touch with truth because they are misinformed by the men uh, who are running the empire. So the men come back from the colonies and they misinform the women, they lie to the woman, and that's how the women keep naively consuming the narrative of imperialism as a worthy mission, as a noble mission. They live in a world of their own and there has been, never been anything like it and never can be. It is too beautiful altogether and if they were to set it up, it will go to pieces before the first sunset. Some confounded fact, we men have been living contentedly with ever since the day of creation, would start up and knock the whole thing over. So this is a very misogynistic take uh, on the woman's position in Hollow Darkness. But this is also the way the woman was misinformed uh, in, in this that kind of a cultural setting where they became the naive consumers uh, of imperialism being a civilizing mission, imperialism being a Christian mission, etc. So any refutation to that would, uh, according to Mahler, would completely unsettle their little beautiful world, the bubble world of uh, nobility and Christianity, etc. Right? So this is how imperialism dressed up, this is how imperialism manufactured and redescribed itself uh, through all these lovely little beautiful clothes. Uh, quite uh, refuting the, quite disguising the fact, quite effacing the fact that it was actually a profit-making enterprise, a naked uh, mercantile enterprise. So the naked mercantile quality of imperialism is disguised and what gets foregrounded and what gets consumed by this misinformed insiders like Malus Aunt is a Christian mission, is a noble mission, is a civilizing mission and that becomes, uh, and that's a cynical uh, perspective that Malu is taking at the moment. After this I got embraced, uh, told to wear flannel, be sure to write often and so on and I left. In the street, I don't, uh, in the street, I don't know why a queer feeling came to me that I was an imposter. So again, this becomes a very important point where he's, he knows he's about to pretend something big. Uh, he's about to carry on a magnificent pretension, a spectacular sham, uh, which is imperialism, right? So he's about to become an agent in that spectacular sham. He's about to pretend something that he's not. So the feeling of being an imposter comes to him and this is what connects him uh, to the hollowness of his knowledge. Uh, you know, at the end we'll talk about how the only enlightenment that he gets is a negative enlightenment. Uh, he is uh, paradoxically uh, a seer, paradoxically a prophet, uh, because he realizes how hollow this entire knowledge is. Whereas people like his aunt, people like Cruz's intended, they keep consuming the glory of the imperialism, where he knows for a fact that there's no glory at all. And his uh, awareness of hollowness is what makes him substantial as a prophet, ironically. So the only knowledge available is knowledge of nothingness. The only knowledge available is the knowledge of darkness. The only enlightenment available is the knowledge of anti-enlightenment. And that's what how the darkness is all about. So his whole position of being an imposter comes to him. It sort of makes him uneasy. Uh, what thing that I, who used to clear off for any part of the world at 24 hours notice, with less thought than most men give to crossing the street, had a moment, I won't say of hesitation, but of startled pause before this commonplace affair. So before that he was an adventurer, he would just go out and travel different parts of the world. But for the first time he's working for a colonial company and that's what's making him a bit uneasy. The best way I can explain it to you is by saying that for a second or, th or two, I felt as though instead of going to the center of a continent, I were about to set off to the center of the earth. So again, this is the underworld image comes, comes up again. He's about to think that he's ab about to go into the underworld. Uh, instead of the center of the continent of Africa, he's about to go somewhere very dark, somewhere where you know, no illumination reaches. I left in a French steamer and she called in every blamed plot, a port to have out there. As far as, far as I could see, the sole purpose of landing soldiers and custom house officers. So it was this old French steamer who keep, kept picking up, uh, picking up all kinds of customs officers and soldiers. I watched the coast. Watching a coast as it slips with the ship is like thinking about an enigma. 
There it is before you, smiling, frowning, inviting, grand, mean, insipid or savage and always mute with an air of whispering. Come and find out. So this enigmatic quality board, this whole enterprise begins to make its presence felt as an ever receding kind of a threshold. This one was almost featureless, as if still in the making with an aspect of monotonous grimness. The edge of a colossal jungle, so dark green uh, that to be almost black, fringed with uh, white surf ran straight like a ruled line far, far away along a blue sea whose glitter was blurred by creeping mist. The sun was fierce, the land seemed to glisten and drip with stream. Here and there, greyish whitish specks showed up, clustered inside the whole surf, with a flag flying above them perhaps. Settlements some centuries old and still no bigger than pinheads on the untouched expanse of their background. We pounded along, stopped, landed soldiers, went on, landed customs officer, customs house clerk to levy toll in what looked like God forsaken wilderness with a tin shed and a flagpole lost in it, landed more soldiers to take care of the custom house clerks, presumably. So you can look at the monotony in the entire thing. It's about soldiers and customs house officers, soldiers protecting customs house so officers and customs house officers stationed because of soldiers. So it's like a complete, the absurdity of the whole enterprise begins to make its presence felt. The meaninglessness, the mechanical way in which this journey begins is something which is described in great details. And the whole idea that God forsaken wilderness becomes important. It's like an abundant thing. You know, it's exhausted, it's abundant, it's, it's completely liquidated, it's like a shutdown of spiritual sustenance, and that's how that's why it's traveling. Some I heard got drowned in the surf, but whether they did or not, nobody seemed particularly to care. So this great massive spectacular indifference to any human concern, to any human emotion, is what determines and characterizes this entire machinery of imperialism, something which Mado experienced right at the heart of Brussels' office. No one seemed to care about anyone, right? And this complete carelessness, this complete indifference to any human concern is what marks, like I said, the whole profit-making enterprise of imperialism, which ironically is never really realized as someone like Marlowe's aunt, who still thinks of imperialism as a grand noble Christian enterprise and his company as being an emissary of knowledge, an emissary of enlightenment, etc. <clears throat> they were just flung out there and on we went. Every day uh, the coast looked the same as though we had not moved. So again, this immobility is important over here. It seems as if he's not moving at all. This is stationary, claustrophobic quality was his entire enterprise. He's just moving on without realizing he's moving. He's just stuck in some limbo. And that limbo quality is important for Malu over here. Okay. Uh, and the last bit is important, uh, the idleness of a passenger, my isolation amongst all these white men, all these men with whom I had no point of contact, the oily and languid sea, the uniform somberness of the coast seemed to keep me away from the truth of things within the toil of a mournful and senseless delusion. So all these words are important, the senseless delusion, it's almost like a delusion is traveling into a delusion, into a dream and it's idle, it's completely alienated. So this is obviously the beginning of Malo's alienation. It's completely alienated from the product uh, and this is a very classic Marxist kind of an alienation where the laborer is completely un un unconnected, disconnected from the end product which is the ivory in this particular case. So he gets more and more physically, existentially, spiritually alienated and he feels himself to be in a limbo state, moving into an underworld. And the last bit is important, um, the toil of a mournful and senseless delusion. And the sea around is an oily, languid sea. So again, it becomes a very, very toxic kind of a natural presence around him. It's not a soothing nature, it's not a calming nature, it's a toxic nature, one which has slightly cannibalistic quality about it. And obviously this is a projection of his own mind. Uh, it's not nothing to do with the sea as such, but a projection of his own mind, which is getting more and more consumed by alienation, more and more consumed by despair, or consumed with the knowledge of his own uh, pretension. That's something which Heart of Darkness will keep foregrounding as we move on. So we'll stop at this point today and we'll move on and see how it connects to Marlowe's larger sense of alienation and how that becomes an existence of horror, an experience of horror, which is uh, encountered by Marlowe and uttered by Kurtz, and how that gets reported or misreported at the end of the novel when Marlowe comes back to Brussels and reports about Kurtz's death to his intended. And that's something we'll talk about in great details as we move on. So we'll stop at this point today and we'll move on and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.